morning is a morning of worship. It's a morning of praise and thanksgiving. This week I've been studying uh, Psalm 63. And it's the psalm that David wrote when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Wilderness and Judah. This morning, I want you to understand that you may be in a dry place, but Judah, your praise will carry you through. Faith does not stop life from happening, but faith will carry you through to the place that you need to be. So this morning, Psalm 63, I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. So no matter where you are this morning, what situation you may be in, I will advise you to take hold of praise. Get your Judah activated this morning and let it carry you out of your dry place. Let it carry you out of the place that brings depression and brings you sorrow. Because if you really look at it, you have so much to be thankful for. You have a church family that loves you, but most of all, you have a God that loves you unconditionally. Amen? Amen. Amen. So uh, let's pray, and then let's praise. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. We thank you that we have the freedom to lift up our hands in your sanctuary and to give you glory, to give you honor, and to give you all the praise. Now, Lord, use this worship team to usher us into your presence. I ask for a special anointing upon them this morning as they do your work, as they become your vessels. And Lord, in, in return, let us stand and lift up our hands and glorify you for all the things that you do with you. We love you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing some Christmas songs this morning. Is that all right, y'all? I hope so. I mean, it's um, we invite you to stand uh, if you would like to stand and join us. Some of these songs at the beginning are going to be a little slower, but we're going to speed up as we go along a little bit.
Good morning. Good morning. This morning I'm here on behalf of the church council to honor someone who has served this church for a long time. Ken Nisley has been an integral part of church council as the treasurer for the past 12 years. And many years before that on the financial committee. Ken has spent many days each week fulfilling the treasury position while also getting supplies from Sam's Club and the list can go on and on. And Ken has done this all as a volunteer. Over the past couple years, and myself being on the council, I've grown to know Ken better. He's not just family, but I know him as a treasurer. Ken has a loving spirit that's always ready to look for God's calling and God's leading. Ken, you have always been willing to help us create opportunities when finances don't look like they're there. You helped us pay off the church years early. You are always looking for opportunities to bless those around you, and it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you for being willing to listen to God's call for you and your service to God in day spring. And I wouldn't do justice honoring you, Ken, if I didn't honor also Sue. Thank you for supporting Ken <coughs> through this time. I know it's a sacrifice of time and, and energy. Thank you. Ken, we'd like to honor you today with a personalized gift, a portfolio, and Sue, take him out to dinner to Applebee's. <laughs> Thank you all for your hard work and dedication to Day Spring, and safe travels to you and Sue as you head south. I'd also like to take time to pray for them and then also for the offering, so if the ushers, you would come forward. We bow your heads. Dear Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for Ken and Sue and the dedication to this church and others that have supported them here. We thank you for their love and your love. Lord, bless this offering. Help us use it to your ability to do your, to do your work. We thank you for this day. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence here this morning. We ask that, Lord, you speak through Pastor Charlie this morning. Open up our ears to hear, our hearts to receive what the Spirit is saying. Lord, we ask that you protect this vessel as he delivers your message. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Church, here we are. I'm going to tell you, the hardest part of this day for me is over now, so I'm excited. <laughs> I haven't played that horn in about 15 years, and here comes Andrew saying, you, we need you to pull your trumpet out. I said, I'm preaching, dude. I'm preaching. No, you can do it. You can do it. It's just one song. It was fun. I appreciate this time of the year, a time for us to expand and do lots of different things. You know, for the last 17 years, Wendy and I have attended this church, and some of you have been with us the whole time. You've watched the transition from Coach Grimes, Pastor Chuck. I get a little emotional. Think about all the goodness that God has given my life in these last several months. Leading up to this, the first time that I preach a message as Pastor Chuck, rather than Coach Grimes. Because there's a difference. Although the 22 years I spent at Malone University was a great preparation, it's not the same as pastor. And I am honored and thankful for the support and the love, the gifts and the talents that all of us uh, have here at Daysprey. And it is a true honor and a pleasure to step forward and serve you with everything that I have as Pastor Chuck. Christmas and Advent is a time of expectation. We've talked about that the last four weeks. Expectations. But I have a feeling that we are in the room today and some of us have rewritten Christmas with our own expectations. A picture of what we think Christmas should be, of what it ought to be, what it could be, what we long for, what it would be like if we were writing the story. Maybe it, it goes like this. Chestnuts roasting on the open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Yuletide carols being sung by a choir. And folks dressed up like it's fires. And there's a roast in the oven. And the tree is just so perfectly decorated. And the cookies have just the right amount of frosting and sprinkles on them. And the kids are all nestled in, and they all get along so much. Well. And there was no traffic, it was just smooth as silk. And all the families together, and everybody gets along just great. And all is well with the world, and we're warm, and we're safe, and we've got enough money. Political parties are getting along. <laughs> 
I'm afraid that's not the reality that we live in, is it? We're picturing a quaint, quiet evening around the fire and on the fireplace. Just the right amount of garlic in the check, check mix. Creating a calm joy to the world, sweet and heavenly peace, Christmas. I hope you enjoyed it, because that's about the all of it that you're going to get this year, right? Because the tension is building for many of us, has been building. This tension of the expectation of what we would want versus what the reality of it really is. This Christmas, you may be facing any number of trials and changes, pains and hurts, depressing, defeating, disheartening. And the expectation only makes it worse. Hope deferred makes my heart sick because you know that it isn't going to happen that way. Some of you are not feeling, feeling at all a thrill of hope. You may feel as if you've lost hope altogether. And you're on the outside of this magnificent time, wonderful time of the year. But I'm here to stand in front of us this morning and remind us that we are in great company. We're not alone. Because you realize the very first Christmas didn't go much like any of us would plan it either. Right? Mary is nine months pregnant. She is great with child. And those of us who have children know exactly what that time means. She's betrothed to a young man, a man of honor, but she's convinced her family and friends that the child conceived within her is actually from the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. And now, because of Almighty Caesar Augustus, we have to travel to my betrothed's hometown, some 80 miles, to Bethlehem. And when we arrive, there is no place for us to stay. And so we borrow a stable. And one night, while we are alone, the baby and the water That is not at all like I predict that Mary and Joseph would have written the story. I want to remind us all of a passage of scripture that maybe Jer uh, Joseph and Mary knew of. You realize that the characters in these stories had for their reference the most of our Bible, the Old Testament. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. It goes on to say that you'll be my people and you'll worship me. You'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And so Mary might be pondering all of this. We'll talk about that in a moment. And she's saying, Lord, this didn't go anything like what I would plan. But I'm going to trust that it's going like you're planning. Because I'm going to trust that God has a plan for my life. And if you're here today and you're struggling with the expectation of what Christmas should be or what it could be, I'm here to tell you that, that was your concoction you need to trust that God has a plan for you. And you might feel like you're on the outside of everyone celebrating this joyous and most wonderful time of the year, but you're not alone. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And let's pick the story up in verse 8. Luke 2, verse 8. Shepherds outside, the, outside in the fields of Bethlehem. These folks were outsiders. Shepherds were sort of the downcast and the outcasts of society in that time. They were not to be trusted. They were dirty. But they were in the region, out in the field, keeping watch, watch over their flock by night, as they did most every night. 
Verse 9, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled, they were filled with great fear. Of all the places and all the people and all the times that this wonder was to be revealed, the wonder is revealed to the outcasts. Some 700 years earlier, Isaiah had predicted that this would happen. Some 400 years ago, we see the close of the Old Testament and a silence from God until this very moment. An angel of the Lord appears to shepherds, simple people, out in the fields watching their flocks. Of all the places, of all the people, of all the times, to reveal this wonder, it's revealed to shepherds. Let's dig into this message. They were fear, they were filled with great fear in verse 9. And verse 10, the angel said to them, as many times angels do with their interactions with humans, their first words are, fear not. Fear not. And just like you or me, the translation here for the shepherds, megaphobic. They were megaphobic. They were filled with great fear. The angel says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. I bring you good news that will be for all people. I bring you, shepherd, the news that is for everyone. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who's Christ, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. <coughs> this will be the sign to you. She's lying in a manger. Shepherds know where mangers are. And they probably knew every stable and barn and manger in Bethlehem. So they say to themselves, let's look at verse 12. Verse 13, sorry. And suddenly there was an, there with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. And the connotation here, the, the, the translation for heavenly host, is not necessarily white flowing robes and harps and lyres. The heavenly host word here translated has a military context. So I don't want you to think about flowing angels in the sky with harps and lyres. Let's think of the military, the warriors of God, marching in formation for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Of all the people, of all the places, to reveal this wonder, it was the shepherds out in the fields, outside that land. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And then they, they reveal their worship to God out in the field. Glory to God in the highest. We just sang it. Gloria in excelsis Deo. That's what that means. Glory to God in the highest ever in excess. And on earth, peace to those whom, whom he is pleased. The shepherds needed to realize that they are the recipients of this wonder. And they worshiped along with the angelic host because God was pleased with them. To be the recipients of this was a great honor. And so follow along in verse 15. When the angels went away from them, the shepherds said to one another, well, we've got nothing better to do. We might as well go and see if it's actually true. Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, 
which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that which was told to them concerning this child. You see, wonder was revealed, and worship was the result, and now witness was their response. And I'm certain that they continued their worship of this baby in a very tender, quiet moment to truly believe, because of what they had seen and heard, that this was truly the Messiah, the promised Savior. Christ the Lord. You know, I've had a tender moment with Jesus. Most of us have. I've had a tender moment with Jesus when he was on the cross. And I've had a very tender, intimate moment with Jesus when he was resurrected and standing outside an empty grave. But in studying and, and contemplating and pondering and shepherds this morning, I want to encourage you this Christmas season to have a special intimate moment with the baby Jesus in a manger. I think we gloss over that sometimes. And I would challenge you to have that intimate moment sometime this Christmas season. Let me give you some takeaways here because they go and they tell everyone who will listen about what they've experienced. They know the wonder. They've worshipped the king. And now they witness to their experience. And people are amazed. The ESV says people wondered at what they, at what they said. And in verse 19, Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. She put the dots together. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told to them. Kent, last week you did a marvelous job. Mary, did you know that your baby boy someday ruined the nation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know? And you know what? I think she did. I think she did. But what I'll challenge you is that song wasn't written for Mary. It was written for you and I. Did we know? Did we realize in that intimate moment with the Savior in a manger, that he would do all of those things. Although this time of year could be extremely busy, filled with planning, family trips, gatherings, food, presents, and as we learned Wednesday night at the kids' program, the hustle bustle of Christmas, we must reserve time and take the bandwidth so that we don't miss the chance to wonder once again at our Savior born in a manger. We have an excellent opportunity this time of year to truly and deeply, authentically, and humbly come and worship our Savior simply, quietly, and humbly. It's not like other weeks of the year. Come as the shepherds did. Honest, genuine, and humble. If you have truly experienced God writing himself into the story, then be a witness to that. You see, the shepherd's testimony was true, and it was undeniable because it was their testimony. And it wasn't a testimony of hellfire and brimstone looking down their noses and telling people they needed to come to Jesus or they're going to hell. It was simply their experience of the glory of God shining around them and going and finding the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in nature. And having that tender moment with Jesus because he came 
Emmanuel, to be with us. Certainly, he came to die for us. He came and was resurrected for us. We'll get to that in a couple months. But right now, brothers and sisters, let's contemplate and ponder along with Mary the essence of Christmas. Let me tell you about an author that I stumbled across in my, in my research. Dorothy Sayers was a British author from, she was born in 1893, died in 1957. She was an English crime writer and mystery writer living during the First and Second World Wars. She's best known for her mysteries, a series of novels and short stories set between the First and Second World Wars that feature an English aristocrat and amateur detective, Lord Peter Winsey. <coughs> and the books still remain popular even today. But one distinctive feature of her work is the introduction of a certain character named Harriet Vane. Harriet, like Dorothy, was the first female graduate of Oxford University. <coughs> she happened to be a crime and mystery writer in stories, and even physically resembled the author in every way. Harriet Vane represented and radiated the essence of the author, Dorothy Sayers, in all of the stories. You see, Dorothy Sayers had fallen in love with the world that she had created. And so she wrote herself into the story. Let me remind you of one of the most powerful verses that we could ever measure and remember, memorize within ourselves. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God has written himself into the story. Has he written himself into your story? The babe in the manger, God with us, Emmanuel. And we are not too unlike the shepherds. Perhaps we need to trust that God does have a plan for our lives, even this Christmas. In all of the chaos, he's there. <coughs> and he came for all men. He came into this world just like you and I did. We too can experience the wonder and the worship and the witness of Christ our King. And there may be three different types of people in the room right now, and I want to call you to response. Folks, these worship folks are going to sing a wonderful song for us. <coughs> but you might be in one of three categories this morning. One is that you truly have resonated with the idea that a baby and that God himself has come into the world. The wonder of that story. Reconnect with the wonder of that story this Christmas season. Because it isn't a story that man could have made up. Amen? We wouldn't have done it this way. We wouldn't have done it like this at all, Lord. But that isn't that like our Lord. And you need to connect with the wonder of Christmas again. Some of us are in a place where we understand all that and perhaps we've not responded properly in worship. And so I want you to worship this Christmas. We have a wonderful opportunity on Tuesday night to be here together, to have an intimate moment with Jesus, the baby in a manger, and to simply worship him because he came. Certainly he died, certainly he was resurrected, but he came. And we will focus Tuesday night on the mere wonder that he can, that he has written himself into the story. Some of us may be so compelled with the wonder and the worship that we need to tell someone. It's not laborious. It's not, it's not hard to tell of this great wonder. 
and this wonderful Lord when we truly experience him in our hearts. I hope that helps you this morning. If you have tension between your expectations of what Christmas should be and what it actually is. And I'll just simply end as they start to play with a wonderful quote from one of my favorite Christmas characters out of the mind of Charles Schultz. It was Linus who simply said, that's what Christmas is really all about, John.
powerful message. I was still stuck on wonder is revealed. And I think that's just a prayer for me this week that Pastor Charlie just gave me. I want him to reveal his wonder in my life. Let's take this time to share what you received from the message. We'll get to prayer with us later. We have mics in the back. Just raise your hand and we'll come to you. 